That's the doorbell at Jimmy's house. Now when you come to my house, my doorbell sounds like this. Hey, welcome to People's Radio United, the People's Weekly Show. Um, I'm Tim. I'm here with St. Louis Gell, Steve Shagwell, Canadian Glenn, and Nolan Hack. How are you guys doing? 1.30, the cardiologist. Ooh. I'm doing good. Cool. I, so, oh, go ahead. I am happy to be here because I thought I was going to sleep in, but I made it. So that's that's my accomplishment. <laughs> Aren't you an hour behind me? Like, what, isn't it one o'clock there now or no? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um. So, yeah, well, Glenn, let's start with you. Anything new coming up you want to talk about? Well, I've got uh, three shows left before I take my holidays for the year, so they're all booked. Uh, This next week I'm going to have on for a record-setting sixth appearance on The View Up Here, Canadian uh, social commentator, satirist Stephen Loutons. Uh, The working title for our episode this Wednesday is going to be Today's Conservatives, Law and Order, without the law. Hmm. So, so you can take it from there. After that, I'm going to have on a a very, very well-known indigenous spokesperson activist in Canada named Russ Diabo. He will be part of the delegation going to Geneva in the second week of August for the uh, committee meeting, uh, the Committee to End Racial Discrimination of the United Nations. And... uh, Russ kind of turned me on to that, that I should look at it because, you know, everybody has this assumption that Canada is this upholder of human rights and it's a place where people know what's right and what's wrong. Mm. Well, when you take a look at the reports that are going into the committee for the United Nations, the rest of the world knows what a crock of shit that description is. And every Canadian government for the last 150 years has known what a crock of shit that assessment is. But the governments and the Canadian media let it live on. They don't, you know, tell the truth about how some things Canada does. You would think it was Iraq or Turkey or, you know, Guatemala. So we're going to talk about the reality compared to the perception, shall we say. That's awesome. You left the you left the U.S. out of that. Russ list. is great. Russ is great. That's a, that's pretty cool that you're going to have him on. Yes, he's been a very very tough guy to nail down. He's very busy. He's always in a different city for a different event on a different day. He's a very busy man, and uh, yeah, I look forward to having him on. Awesome. Great show. No ignorance. Um, some two things, of course, racism and ignorance, that are uh, big pillars of Donald Trump. Uh, so, if you want to participate in this, it'll be uh, this fall in October. Uh, you can email me uh, at nolanawhack at gmail dot com. That's n o l a n a w h a c k uh, at gmail dot com. Also, I want to say very quickly. Uh, If you have five minutes today, please write a man named Kevin Cooper a letter. Uh, Kevin Cooper is a black man uh, who's been on death row for over three decades. uh, And this is one of the most ridiculous injustices I've ever seen outside of them actually putting a bullet uh, in our heads. Uh, His habeas corpus is being blocked, actually, by the crime bill uh, that the Clintons put forth. If you could actually believe that, that's how messed up this case is. Uh, He's in San Quentin, California, state prison. Uh, Please just write to him uh, and show your support. If you don't want to go through the trouble of mailing it, help. 
send me the letter and I'll mail it myself. Uh, Nolan AW hack at gmail.com. Uh, please. And, and you can go to Kevin Cooper, uh, dot org, uh, to learn more about Kevin. Yeah. We did a couple shows on Kevin Cooper. You did some with me too. Um, it's really an important you, thing. You can also go on uh, People's Radio United uh, and it, the shows Tim talked about. Uh, Carol uh, is Seligman. A woman named Sel- 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 Seligman. Uh, Carol's a good friend of mine uh, and on, also on Kevin's team. And uh, Tim did a great interview with her and uh, tells you so much about the case. Uh, it's more... It's, that's not the only interview and uh, show Tim's done on Kevin. He's done, like you said, he's done a few, uh, and you can learn more about Kevin that way. Uh, there's also Google, but uh, and Kevin happens to be one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Uh, he's a great activist. He's a great artist. He has great paintings. Uh, you can look those up online as well. And uh, I mean, I go on and on, but this man needs to be out of prison and off of death row and uh, please write to him and show your support. Cool. Um, who's next? Gal, you want to go and, and I know you're not a promoter, but you... <laughs> <laughs> I'm horrible at promotion. All I could say is we have top gear live on Sunday at 3 PM central time. Since we don't have the Brit here, I can speak in American. <laughs> and I don't we don't have we don't have a topic yet. Um last week we had a topic very early. This week everything changes so quickly that they don't allow me to plan. <laughs> and it, it drives me insane cuz I am a planner and so I'm not allowed to plan things out. Um so I just get told what to do and when to do it. Th- that's all I have. I mean, I just finished a full semester so I'm chilling out watching um the world explode. I can solve your problem. Just plan to be told what to do last minute. There you go. That's what I've been doing for three years. Okay, good. <laughs> I've learned. I've learned to just go with the flow. Uh, usually like an hour before the show, I'll get told to research something. And it's usually something that's like pretty intense research. And I'm like, really? I could have. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Luckily, Top's... I'm a damn good researcher. So. <laughs> Top's not here today because he's getting married. No, he's oh. not getting yeah. married. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had yeah, to... watch that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he sent me, he said, I can't do the show today. I'm going to be at a wedding. So then I said, oh, I'll just wait till we're live on air and say, Tosh getting married. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. His girlfriend's on the show with you. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah. That made it even nice. funnier. Yeah, real fun. Okay. Um... <laughs> You could you could be doing this show live from the altar. We don't know where you're at. Yeah, no. I'm... Okay, let's get to Steve now. I fought the law. You just did a really good show last week. Oh uh, yeah, that went pretty good. And um, uh, let me start off here by by uh, making it known. I I mentioned last week I've been dealing with a lot of unreliable Wi-Fi. So today I'm actually calling in by phone and. Um, there may be some background noises as a result of that, and I apologize for that. And the phone reception out here isn't that good, so there's always a small chance I might drop off all of a sudden. And if that happens, that would be why. So, but the show, um, yes, the the episode four with Andrew Henderson, who is the president of Minneapolis or Minnesota Cop Block, and he's also the cop watch coordinator for communities united against police brutality. Um, he talked at length with me about cop watching, why it's still so important to do, even though there are body cams and dash cams, you know, we went over several reasons why we need to still be filming police. And then he went through what he does to, cop watch properly and stay safe and um things you can do to make sure that your um that what you capture can be used in court by somebody who's been 
brutalized or, you know, unconstitutionally arrested by police. Um, and it was a great episode. Um, you know, two things went on. Andrew was a phenomenal guest. So that was, that was, I would say the, the main ingredient of that. Um, also I, myself, you know, I said this coming in that, you know, I've been on radio before, but it's like playing music and, you know, uh, uh, telling fart jokes and stuff like that. And this like real serious interview and commentary thing, I'm new to it. So I really, I do definitely feel like I definitely made some improvements and got a little more comfortable with it. And just, you know, the whole thing sounds a little more natural. So I'm really happy with it. I'm happy where that went. And I'm currently plotting out what is my next episode going to be about and who's it going to be with. I have a couple ideas. I haven't settled on anything yet. My intention is um, next week to have an announcement as to who the guest is going to be and what it's going to be about. So that's what's going on with I Fought the Law info. Cool. And yeah, I just I just finished um two my non objective opinion shows in the last two weeks. The first one was with um Leanne DeHart and the Weeda Coalition about Matt DeHart. And I think that one went really well, so hopefully you guys will take a listen to that. And then I also just finished one I think yesterday or the day before with I Love My Wife account. Uh I Love My Wife Triple O seven, that's the account. That one went really good. Um really informative about racism and the criminal injustice system and um, terrorism by police to these families. It was, I think it was a really good show that, that people should listen to. Um, and that's about it for me. Uh, we got a lot of big things coming up on people's radio within the next few months, just some all day kind of broadcasts live from different places and stuff. Um, besides the million mask march, in November, but before that, we have a couple big things coming up, so stay tuned for that. So, I guess we'll get started with the topics. What was first, the uh, um, Minneapolis police, the chief oh, that resigned, was a organization. yes, the chief resigned, and then they've been getting trolled with signs up around the city, and there's a lot of crazy stuff going on over the killing of the the white woman out there. Yeah, I'm really glad to see those signs going up because Minnesota is really moving to criminalize peaceful protest, you know, and they, they think by doing so that what they're going to do is they're going to, uh, you know, foil a narrative that is counter to the, the government and police narrative. And they're starting to find out, oh, you want to do that? Well, now we'll just make it worse. I mean, now, you know, you have these signs that are just everybody's laughing at and mocking the police department. It's like, well, you know, you go criminalizing peaceful protests in the streets, you know, good. Now you got this, you know, and I'm very happy about that. I'm glad people are getting creative and being like, well, fine, you're going to do that. Well, we'll come up with something new and it'll be even worse for you. Fuck yeah. <laughs> I just honestly, when I see a, well, two things. When I see a police chief quit, or if I see activists call for the firing of a police chief, I just start yawning. And it's annoyingly. Yeah. I, I yawn annoyingly because it's, it's, it's just, it's it's ridiculous. I, I I don't know how else to put it because you're talking about just firing a criminal. Oh, just fi fire them for one. You, okay, they're fired. You want to arrest them for their all their crimes and all that they let happen here, but then you're just going to replace them with another criminal, probably doing pretty close to the same things for better or worse. Uh, I remember when. Bernard Parks was the chief of police in L.A. Uh, he was awful. Uh, but now we have Chief Beck, who's even worse. 
you know, th- these all these people should be in jail, and we're you know, let's fire them and move on with our lives. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I, th- that's you could really take that to even the Trump thing, because this is how people, especially in Western society, that's how they are. They're so fickle. They're just let's just make them leave their job and that's the end of it. Like, so we're just going to impeach Trump and that's it. Well, then we're going to let Pence come in. That he'll be, he'll, he's much better. That's a whole nother story. I'm not going to get into it, but, uh, yeah. Okay. We're just going to fire these horrible people and move on. We're not going to try to prosecute them or anything. We're not going to, uh, try to put them behind bars. Like this Minneapolis police chief should be in, jail for the rest of her life end of discussion uh and no just just fire her oh she quit okay everything's fine now no more no more cops in minneapolis will kill anybody like it and people are that either lazy or naive or both it's just it's ridiculous (laughs) well while we're talking about chiefs that get fired or resign over this uh, interesting timing as well as Chief Jackson um, from Ferguson, if you remember, resigned Mm -hmm. uh, months after it wasn't, I think it was right after the grand jury indictment, I believe. Um, So it wasn't immediately, but he just published a book and is making hella cash off that because, you know, people are going to buy it. Uh, And he was on The View yesterday uh, promoting his book, so I mean, yeah, they're not in jail. Instead, they're making money off of this bullshit, off of murder. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Gosh, I hate the view. I hate the view so much, and I want women to have yes. much more of a voice than men have ever had, but not like that. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's, the view. The view. Is, oh. Raven is 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 the Raven Jemima still on that show? I think she is. Okay. I don't even know. I qu- I haven't watched it in yeah. a long time. <laughs> isn't, that the show um, Whoopi, isn't that the show Whoopi Goldberg's on? I don't know. I don't watch it either. I'm usually at work. Yeah, and who's going to be in a movie about 9-11 oh, with two great, great uh, stars of the cinematic screen, Charlie Sheen and Gina Gershon. <laughs> I really was. I really was hoping for great ones, man. Damn you! What? I mean, come on. From, from, what? Charlie uh, Sheen is great. He's a Vatican assassin, man. Winning. I had a huge Tiger crush on. Blood. I had a huge I mean, crush on Charlie Sheen when I was twelve, and like, it, it's it, it's just heartbreaking now. I well, feel horrible I, about that crush. From a from a purely look standpoint, Gina Gershon is beautiful. Oh, absolutely. But you're talking about acting, that's a whole different story. And they're going to do a movie about 9-11. Uh, Charlie, I saw the trailer, like, Charlie's in the in one of the towers, and the plane hits, and Whoopi's on the, I guess he's like a responder, uh, 911, and she's telling them, yeah, a plane hit the building. We're under attack. And then, of course, my, my revolutionary brain kick, kick, kicked in. So you have a black woman going, we are under attack. I'm like, really? Because I don't think, I mean, yes, we're in the country. We're technically citizens. But I don't think they're attacking black people. They're attacking America, you know, which is anti-black. That's what, well, I'm, and I'm going on a tangent. But, uh, yeah, so that's funny that Whoopi is, uh, used to be, I would say a pretty respectable person in Hollywood. Uh, we thought, you know, pro-black and uh, great Oscar winner. Uh, but now uh, defending Bill Cosby um, in a movie about 9-11 with Sheen and Kershaw. So that's, you know, that's Hollywood for you, but superficial and fickle. Going back to the whole point about these police chiefs, uh, you know, I, p- people t- talk about you know holding people accountable and holding police officers, well, holding really the people that we pay accountable, tax dollars. 
So, uh, you know, Congress people, uh, you know, the president, uh, people in city council, the police officers, firefighters. And uh, let's just talk. We don't we don't hold these people accountable. No, I want to read. I just found um, a uh, I don't know, a review of Chief Jackson's book. And I just want to read a part of it to you real quick because you're just going to fucking oh, you're going to fucking love this. Former Ferguson Police Chief Jackson adds little clarity to discourse around the controversial 2014 shooting of Michael Brown, an unarmed African-American, by Darren Wilson, a white cop, which ultimately led to Jackson's resignation. He firmly believes that his department was defamed by the unruly media and a biased (laughs) federal investigation. Although the FBI concluded that the shooting was justified, the Justice Department's review of the Ferguson Police Force under Jackson's leadership found a pattern of unconstitutional conduct aimed at the city's african-american population while jackson acknowledges that some mistakes in handling the unrest that followed brown's death for example when police dogs were deployed as a means of crowd control he dismisses such choices as bad optics rather than substantive misjudgments whether or not this is a quote now whether or not the canines legitimately or appropriately serve the goal of the public safety the simple image conjured up memories of selma and little rock and bull connor and provided the first piece of ammunition for anyone who wanted to paint the police out to be dangerous aggressions i'm not going to read all of it but that's just the most of it and his, the name of his book is policing ferguson policing america what really happened for Jeez. fuck's sake what really yeah happened? how many times does fox news but- have them on since the book came out because that sounds like a, a title written by someone from Fox. Absolutely, it really does. Yeah, you know, um, you know, you're so spot on about the the whole thing with firing police chiefs and how it's not going to change anything. You know, Minneapolis. I I understand the next guy up is a Hispanic guy, and so you know he's not white and. You know, look at how inclusive Minneapolis is being. But the chief he's replacing was a Native American lesbian, okay? And a Native American lesbian, there was still all these problems. You know, it's just, it's just a face they put up there. And not only that, but when these police chiefs get fired, it's not because of their conduct. You know, it's because, it's, it may be because of how the, the, the image they create for the municipality, but usually they don't even care about that. I'm from Minneapolis. I know some of the politics there, you know, having been an activist against police brutality there. And the thing that's going on is um, this police chief, Janae Harto, she um, locked horns with the head of the police union several times. He didn't like her, Bob Kroll, or as people call him, Bob K.K. Kroll. Um, and, uh, I mean, he's just, he's just a racist piece of shit. I, 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 I equate him to Donald Trump as far as just vile pig of a human being, but that's just my opinion. He, you know, police unions are more powerful than police chiefs. They just are. And that's a big part of it, you know, and then there's some other stuff too, but it's all politics. It's not because of It's not because of this incident that happened. It's not because of the fact that it caused a national incident for Minneapolis on her watch. It's, it's none of that. It's just, it's, it's politics. You know, she had enemies in there and they seized on this to push her out over reasons that had nothing to do with police misconduct or anything going on out on the streets as far as police and citizen relationships, you know, and having come from there, I know that. And so I just wanted to make that very clear about that. Yeah. You know, I'll go go ahead, Tim. I was just going to say, I noticed that a lot of times, even in LA twice, when, when there's a, a a big case, it's all over the media. When uh, police kill somebody black, usually don't, they're usually the, the, one of the things they do is try to bring in a black police chief. Like that's going to make some difference that you have a black oppressor instead of a white oppressor. Well, it's uh, hearing you both say that it it reminded me of a, a slate article about a study by Wayne state, uh, a researcher by the name of Brad Smith came out with a paper in 2003 
it looked at the impact of police diversity uh, on officer in, uh, involved homicides. And uh, he looked at cities with more than 100,000 residents or more, uh, and cities of more than 250,000. Uh, and he says, uh, regardless of city size, there wasn't a relationship between racial representation and police killings. Officer diversity didn't mean much. And we just had uh, Zachary uh, Berahiel's native man, uh, mentally ill, killed by, I think it was two black officers, tased to death. For some reason, they love, tasing is like the new fetish for police officers when they hurt or kill us. Uh, but black officers killed a native man. Uh, it doesn't help. I mean, at times, I've, I've read in some cities or some cases, it actually makes the problem worse. Uh, and uh, I heard the word uh, conditioning earlier today. Uh, and that's, a, I think, a perfect word for this. Uh, you have black people or you have colored people. Uh, they think, hey, if I join the police force, I can either help make this better or I can help stop all the crime and all the bad things that my community is doing and my people are doing because of all, you know, speaking from, from my folks, all oh, the black on black crime. I mean, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I've said this uh, a couple of times publicly because it's given me a lot of heartache. Uh, my former best friend is black. Dude was my best friend for since I was 12. Uh, and finish each other's sentences, all the inside jokes in the world. We call each other all the time. Uh, we weren't in the same city, et cetera, et cetera, the whole nine yards. Um, his brother became a police officer. And I grew up with both of them. And I was good friends with his younger brother, too. But then in, in the last couple of years, when he became a police officer, I didn't know what the hell to say to him. I mean, I've had my phone tapped by the LAPD and the New York Police Department. I've had the FBI follow me. Uh, I've had friends of mine. Uh, their families have been ruined by police violence. Uh, I can't be, I can't be friends with. I can't be friends with a cop. I mean, I, I know. I know the real story. I know even if there is a good cop, they're not allowed to be on the force for very long because they're going to be blackballed. Uh, and trying to explain this to my ex best friend was like trying to bash her head in against the wall to try to break down the wall, uh, because we're conditioned to think that this is our, in part our fault, uh, that the police killings are because we're not complying, uh, because our pants are too low. Uh, because we have do rags or cornrows, uh, or as President Obama called our children in Chicago, uh, gun-toting criminals, and that just that's why you see that that study from Wednesday uh, show that it actually makes it worse in some cases because we're trying to make up in our mind for our own misconduct to police and society by then joining the police force and trying to corral, you know, the misguided young, black youth of America. And it's tragic, but it is what it is. And the only solution in my mind is to get rid of the police. Because, and I, I remember, there's a great book called uh, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. And it just tells a true story of this country before it was this country. And then what happened to actually make this, this country. And 
I did not see the words police or cops in the book and all the descriptions of Turtle Island, a.k.a. America before America, before any white people came. Did not see those words anywhere. And this place is pretty peaceful by comparison. Like 10, 10 times <laughs> uh, more peaceful. And uh, the police have to go. I mean, that's, I, and I'm not saying let's, you know, firebomb or this, that, or another thing. They, they just shouldn't be any more police because look at all the harm that they do all over the country. And for so long. Yeah, there's, I think Minneapolis is actually one of the cities, but there's a couple cities right now talking about um, trying to pass a law to disarm, the, to de-arm the police, to take their guns away from them while they're patrolling. And it'll be more like the UK where if they need guns, they can go get them, but they're not going to be patrolling in the streets with guns so they could just kill people. That is a great idea. Yeah, I mean, we'll see if that ever what? goes through, but it would be beautiful if it did. I think a greater idea would be just disbanding, uh, abolishing law enforcement altogether and Obviously. turn these people into people who, uh, turn these people into instructors who teach us how to defend ourselves and how to, you know, be aware of our own safety and, you know, because people should be taking care of themselves, you know, we shouldn't have blue thugs doing it for us. And that, I, I completely agree. I mean, that, that's in line with what I was just saying. Uh, but to Tim's uh, point, that is a great first step because as much as I wish tomorrow I wake up and I hear that the all the police forces in the United States are gone. Uh, that's not going to happen overnight. So you need to take the steps to make sure that does happen. And I think this is a great first step. Uh, taking away their guns uh, while they're on per- patrol. Because that's, that's a, feeding, it's a feeding frenzy for them. Uh, they see one of us in an area where no one else is looking. And they go, hey, I can take him off the face of the earth. Um, and, of course, they have quotas uh, quotas to put us in jail and harm us. So, and this, I mean, it, it, all this is documented. Uh, it's just we live in a country where the line between the truth and fiction has always been blurred, but even more so now, obviously, with Trump. Um, but yeah. you got you, you. There has to be steps taken like this, and it's a. You said it's a mayoral uh, mayoral candidate in Minneapolis trying to disarm police officers. That's that's brilliant because I mean, you, there's ways to police, quote unquote, police areas without guns. Uh, of course, then you'd have to, in certain cities, I, I don't know about Minneapolis or, or, or Minnesota's, like, open, if they have an open carry situation or not. But if you put this in certain places, you're definitely going to have to uh, regulate uh, gun ownership better. Because if you had this in Texas, then you'd, it'd be like chaos. Oh, God, know? I don't even want to think about St. Louis. St. Louis, Florida, yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, we can't go from zero, zero to 60 as much as we want to, but these are great. This is, a, this would be a great first step and we need to continue to, I think with shows like these, uh, the ideas, the actions, the events that we, the people all on the show try to put together, uh, day in and day out. That's what we try to, uh, have come out of all that is these type of ideas and having more think tanks like these to create those ideas. Uh, cause we can't do this alone. Um, 
It's not going to be one person. It's not going to be one uh, race or a group of people. So we, we also it. we also need to to watch other people's ideas, what they're doing that's effective in their cities, from small things to big things, and and you know, just kind of take take what they're doing that works and what they're doing that doesn't work and apply it to what works and doesn't work for us as well. Like those signs, the um, warning Twin Cities police easily startled signs with the cops shooting in all directions looking scared. Those were awesome. Such a simple yeah. thing to do. You know, and it, and it kind of rattled things. It got on the news and made people think. I just, yeah, little things like that even. Just kind of rip off what you see going on and make it happen in your own cities if you can. That's and I would I like, I, I, I agree, and I, I'd like to add to that, uh, especially as a black person, uh, when we talk about how to, well, I'll, I'll put it like this, when, especially when you're talking about black and indigenous people in this country, and you talk about the revolutionaries, quote unquote, or the radicals, quote unquote, when we talk about what does a post-revolution America look like? Well, we need to stop thinking in colonized terms. Look back at Africa before it was colonized. Look back at Turtle Island, America, the two Americas before it was colonized. Take ideas from that. I hear so many colored people talk about, oh, communism, socialism, communism, socialism. Say, first of all, Karl Marx was a racist. Okay. Mao had his, had his own problems. <laughs> now, communism, great. Okay, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Socialism, great. But can we take it back? Let's go back to, to when we ran our own shows. We had communist ideas and social, socialist ideas, but, but it wasn't they weren't called that. White people didn't have to, didn't put a label on it because they didn't know they, they didn't know or care what we were doing. And it was beautiful. Africa was the envy of the world. It was the richest country on earth. Turtle Island. Beautiful. Beautiful societies all over the place. Look at the, I, I look I, I implore anybody listening to the show, look up the Iroquois Constitution. It is one of the most beautiful documents you will ever read. And ironically, it also has in it, do not go onto someone else's land if you do not own that land. That's sadly, I, that's the worst form of irony ever. But the point is, we don't need to be so limited in our thinking. Let's go back further, especially if you're from a certain group of people, I, Latino, black, uh, Japanese, whatever, because we, so many of us have rich histories of our own, not just in this country where we've been so limited in what we can do. I mean, we've had one colored president. We've had no women president. And yet we're taking everything from American society and white society. We just need to broaden our thinking. That way we can better draw a roadmap for how to get out of this. And then if we do get out of this, what is that going to look like? And let's actually build something for the people, by the people, truly. Yeah, I agree. I just wanted to get back a bit to this this overall narrative because what I've been hearing from you guys is on the protest side, on the change side, something you guys are trying to keep in the conversation is there has to be cooperation between groups in different geographical and even racial areas. There has yeah. to be commonality. We have to tie it in. We have to borrow stuff that what works here, hey, that might work there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But isn't that, in fact, what the opposition has been doing for a very, very long time? And they have in their back pocket 
I mean, even go back to this book that the ex-Ferguson police chief put out. Just look at the title. Policing Ferguson, <laughs> Policing America. Yeah. See, right there with their, their methods of propaganda, the message is what we did in East St. Louis, whoa, that's, that's, that's America. <laughs> Fer- Ferguson's in St. Louis. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a local. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's, that's understandable. I mean, I know there's three or four what we would call suburb cities around St. Louis. And from oh, honey, every- there's 161. Wow, there we you go. We have 161 municipalities that make up St. Louis Metro. That's ridiculous. I don't even understand how that ever happened. To be completely honest with you, I've been raised here, and I can tell you that I didn't know the name of Ferguson. All I knew it as North St. Louis until it happened, and I lived in Jennings at one point, and and that's the the city right next to Ferguson. Like Everything is just north, south. We don't even know the names, and and I've been here for almost 40 years. (laughs) Okay, there's another question. If Ferguson had a different majority of population than what it does... Would people know Ferguson instead no. of just North St. Louis? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. Mm-mm. And it's but not I- the first time that it's happened either. I mean, we can look at that as, as how long this has all been going on, especially the, the killing of unarmed black men. And, you know, Ferguson is what a lot of people think of as what brought attention to the subject. But it absolutely, I mean, less than a month before that, you have Eric Garner. And mm-hmm. I can go back and back and back for 20 years prior to that. I, as, a, as somebody who's only been teaching for 10 years, I can tell you that every month I had a new example that wasn't being talked about on the news, that wasn't being talked about, you know, even when social media started to get big, that wasn't being discussed. Um, but you know, as big as social media was by the time August 2014 came around, that's what made Ferguson known. Um, but you're right, okay. the, the makeup would be, I, I just want to say, even on that sense, I had a, uh, um, uh, a I think it was my, my dad even, who was like, why isn't there rioting and looting over this woman in Minneapolis? And that was like an argument to me. And I was just like, really? Did you just ask me that? You're not going to like that. Well, he didn't like my answer. And and we forget uh, $1.5 million to Michael Brown's family for a death that he should have suffered, according to the Ferguson Police Department, yet you're paying his family $1.5 million. Interesting. Yes, and while we are on the subject of Ferguson, I would like to state that there is a movie coming out August 11th that um, the Ferguson activists, at least, are we are incredibly excited about called Who Streets, and it's a documentary done um, to raise awareness about the activism in Ferguson from that time on. Well, something that I believe it was uh, Nolan that said, this propensity to... Oh, we we got caught killing a black man where we shouldn't have. Okay, the chief's got to go. We'll put a black cop in because that makes things better. I think this is something that is a very primitive visual tool that they've been using for a long time. It's still working as far as they think. But, you know, I think it's very easy to debunk that because... Why do you have stuff like Blue Lives Matter then? (laughs) They don't seem to differentiate between the race of the members of their club with badge and gun. Um, I know it was put into our Skype chat and it's on the list. Look what Trump had to say in his speech to law enforcement. Yeah, I so, had that pulled up. I was going to bring that up to, to those listening. And, of course, the police in the crowd cheer wildly. Oh, look, the biggest thug in the world is telling us we should be thugs. Right on. Isn't life great? And the thing is, the thing I wonder is out in that crowd of police, there are white cops, black cops, Asian cops, Latino cops, male cops, female cops. And yet... There seems to be a majority of them, I'm not saying all, of course not all, but there seems to be a majority of them that they can forget their divisions on the racial and the gender issues because we're cops. How come that can't happen 
out in society as a whole against the yeah they, they go out and they look at they look at a, a black guy on the street and you know well, that's a thug you know without knowing anything about him they see a black guy in a police uniform and well i'm sure some in some in law enforcement do because white supremacy is a thing in law enforcement but you know yeah it is it is it is different when they're a cop and that's like why well you know just like you said the police see a black citizen and their propensity may be to say thug and then on the other hand those same black citizens see a black cop what do they think token you know i mean there's so much under undercurrent assumptions and norms that are being assumed by everybody on both sides of this. I think that's one of the biggest problems to getting actual change in the way we deal with this. You know, uh, uh, the word thug, it just, it just brought to mind, um, uh, something that I've just been irritated as hell about and just need to get off my chest real quick. This word thug is I, I always see these, you know, uh, blue lives matter people, the Trump nation, etc. You know, they talk about thugs when they talk about black people who are being activists. Well, first of all, you know, most activists are not violent criminals. They're just not. And, and I know this because I work among activists, but more importantly than that is the thing about this, this, this word thug is, um, and then, of course, there's the fact that, you know, the way it's thrown around is incredibly racist. I mean, everybody knows that. But, like, to these Blue Lives Matter Trump Nation people, you know, somebody needs to tell them. Because um, I, I, actually, I actually know and I'm friends with, like, outlaw motorcycle clubs and this sort of thing. I've seen what thug is. And if these people actually really encountered thug they 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 would uh uh their their whole reality would be destroyed because like what real thug behavior is is i don't know it's just it's so stupid to call uh uh some black people with signs thugs you know so it's the southern strategy it's to use yeah, coded it, words yeah well, it's, yeah, it's, it just it just bothers the hell out of me because that's not thug. I mean, again, y'all want to see thug? Come on, <laughs> I'll introduce you to some people I know, and then you're you're gonna wish you'd never met a thug. Well, it's like the well, it, it's pure white spine. It's like uh, the word terrorist. Yes, this nation was literally formed off of terrorism and terrorists. Yet the only terrorists that I guess uh, I exist nowadays are activists of uh, color and Muslims, uh, oh. or well, oddly enough, Arabs. Even though I was just going to say Arabs, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Americans think all. I think we talked about this on a different show, but uh, the Americans think all Arabs in America are Muslim. Actually, only about twenty four, twenty five percent of them are uh, Muslim in America. Uh, and uh, Gal, I think you were the one to uh, say that stat uh, originally. But I, it's funny you bring up the, uh, when you were talking about the word thug. Uh, there's a show on Netflix, very entertaining show. It's called Last Chance You. Last Chance You. Uh, it's about a community college football team or a powerhouse in uh, like the lower division of one of the lower divisions of college football. Um, and there, at the end of the first season, uh, there was a big fight and they were, it knocked them out of, they were banned from the playoffs. They had a chance at the national championship, but they were banned from the playoffs and their coach who's white and this team is in Mississippi. So most of the players are black started calling the team thugs and say that, oh, that was, you all look like a bunch of thugs out there. That was thuggish mentality. Thug, 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 thug. Now, obviously, most teams black. Football is predominantly a black sport. Once they started us uh, 
once they finally let us uh, play way back when. And, uh, I mean, it's, that's just one of those terms. It's when that word usually comes out of a white person's mouth, it's, a, it's, it's racist. That's usually, the, that's what happens. And you're talking about activists here who are peaceful and yet we're thugs. I mean, and this goes way back. This goes back to slavery. You know, Harriet Tubman is a terrorist. And he's uh, uh, put a bounty on her head. All for trying to save people from slavery. Martin Luther King, he's a danger to America. He's a criminal. He's a terrorist. He's a, all these civil rights activists are thugs. Yet they're all sitting in... Uh, Restaurants peacefully, marching the streets peacefully, and for the nowadays same deal peacefully. You know, Black, Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. Just a narrative well, that is created and people buy it. Well, how and many it, times did you hear the word well, "thug" thrown around during the women's march or the science march? That that wasn't a term used for those marches for those activists. Very funny. That's very funny. You bring that up because, and the women's march, well, uh, a lot of them, especially the one in D.C., was very racist. There was there oh, was, St. Louis was as well. Yeah, L.A. Uh, they, I did not know this part until yesterday, but uh, Raquel Willis, uh, who's a wonderful trans activist of color, was actually her speech was cut short. And she was taken off stage. And, of course, on that particular march in Washington, uh, you had a former CIA informant, Gloria Steinem, uh, speak. Uh, and yet you're have, talking about inclusion and, and, and people of color and all this stuff. Uh, so that kind of shows you how narratives get formed and how narratives aren't put in certain situations like you said with the women's march or the science march etc you know what the whole, the oh. whole thing about terrorists you know the whole thing about using the word terrorist when you look at who uses the word terrorist to describe black lives matter you know it's it's the uh angry white conservative nation and i think the fact that they use the word terrorist is not only completely idiotic and just fails in the face of logic. But another thing it does is it shows just what entitled whiny, spoiled, rotten snowflake brats these people are because they equate blocking a freeway with terrorism. Yes. I mean, there's countries where terrorism actually happens and they should go over there and they should see what terrorism actually is. They should drag their privileged sheltered ass over to a country where terrorism happens and they should see what it is. And then they should come back here and those dipshits should tell me that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. So, you know, we, we, we're the terrorists in many, many other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. But, but let's go back to thug and pirate and all those words. The people I would think, if you're going to look at a thug and a pirate, they kill people, they beat people up. They extort money from people. They they do all kinds of illegal things. And that's basically what the police do. Yes. They extort money from... I mean, now they have the civil forfeiture laws coming up. And, you know, they kill people on a daily basis. They're the thugs. They're the pirates. I'm sick of them calling other groups that. They're not well, I heroes. Think, I just want to make one statement that kind of ties the timeline in. I hope people think about it. Uh, Israel was <laughs> founded on terrorism. Yeah. And those terrorists went on to become prime ministers and exalted founders of the Israeli state. When apartheid was in power in South Africa, Nelson Mandela was being held in prison as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Once yeah. apartheid falls, he becomes the president and wins a peace prize. So, I mean, same old, same old. It's just that it's become down to the neighborhoods now in America. Because it yeah. works and people have accepted it. 
If people accept that Israel was founded by freedom fighters instead of terrorists, then they'll believe anything that they're told about their backyard. Narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Narrative. Yeah. Great narrative. Absolutely. Leonard but Glenn did you look seven yeah. times nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Yep. Seven times Leonard Peltier. He's going to die in prison. And he terrorist. Terrorist. Narrative. Yep. Well, Glenn, did you know, you know in the United, uh, United is in the United States right now, they're they're making it easier for police to take people's property, their houses, their cars, their money, um, because even if even if they're not criminals, just if the cops decide they suspect them of a crime. Yeah, well, I mean, yep, civil I'm, forfeiture. Yeah, I'm familiar f- with this from when the DEA brought it in in the '80s. And I I know that I know that it was just a federal forfeiture law and it was related to the DEA and RICO and stuff like that. At that point in time, I mean, when when you've got this like, you know, an Al Capone organization, all these players have all this coin and they're doing all this stuff, but nobody can prove where any of the money came from. Okay, yeah, just take it away. It's. I can understand that, but yeah, I mean, it was, now it was it's meant to cripple mafia organizations and terrorist organizations. It wasn't meant to be used against the everyday person. Exactly. Now it's being used to simply devalue, to depossess people who differ from the opinion of the state. And that's flat out fascism. You have uh, police in Chicago and its surrounding suburbs seized $150 million over the past five years. Those seizures were heaviest in low-income neighborhoods, according to public records. Oh, yeah. C- uh, civil forfeiture itself has become more... Uh, where is it? I have it right here. Law enforcement took more stuff from people than burglars did in 2014 and it's oh, continued yeah. to increase in 2015 2016 so it's continuously and by 24 by 2014 it was over a billion more that they were making that they were getting than burglary in the entire year in the entire country and a lot of these people most of them maybe weren't even charged with the crime correct Yes, that's what I wanted to bring up. Um, what a lot of people don't realize with civil forfeiture, it has nothing to do with uh, charges, conviction, anything like that. Law enforcement can confiscate property from citizens and businesses without obtaining any kind of warrant, any kind of conviction, or any charges. Uh, once their property has been seized, uh, Americans who have been involved in this have to kind of navigate the um, the judicial system, uh, which is completely upside down in, in this case, and as we know in most cases, um, they have to, they are not guaranteed a lawyer, so they have to hire a lawyer, or they have to be their own lawyer, and they have to file a claim to the property contesting the forfeiture. And if they fail to do so within a given time period, the property is automatically forfeited by default. And that's what happens alone, um, I mean, most of the time. Uh, like the DEA alone, just in 2007, made $3.2 billion just from civil forfeitures. Jesus. Wow. This is huge, and the reason I wanted to bring it up last week is because the Justice Department has now sigled, signaled Sessions specifically that he wants more police property seizures. He wants it to increase. Um, and there is a fantastic John Oliver um, piece, he actually covered this a few months ago, that goes into great detail with civil forfeitures and the ridiculousness of it. And he gets some great interview, well, not interviews, but, you know, um, for example, he talks, um, he finds a video from the Columbia, Missouri. There was like a like a little hearing, and the police chief was try, had to explain, you know, what they were doing with this money and how they got this money. And, and he specifically states that there's no reason we got it because we wanted a new toy. That was his exact words, the, the, and that was on the you know state legislature of Missouri, which doesn't surprise me. Missouri's backwards as hell, but it's not just Missouri; it's everywhere. Yeah, this is a this is a big thing now. The civil forfeiture, like you said, and um, you know, it, it, Donald Trump too. Let's let's be clear. You know, uh, uh, Sessions. Mm -hmm. has signaled he's going to do it. He has the full backing of the president. For anybody who thinks, well, 
you know, Donald Trump hired this guy Sessions, and Sessions is like, he's out there, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, Trump doesn't agree with him on everything, so Trump doesn't agree with him about this, I'm sure. No, um, you can actually see it on YouTube, Trump himself talking at a meeting of, of um, top cops, you know, law, some big law enforcement summit, and he he refers to somebody who said he was, you know, uh, opposed to civil forfeiture and thought it was being abused and, or something like that. Trump said, we can take his job, can't we? You know, and another time Trump said, well, if, you know, somebody said, well, what we're looking for, we need a, we need a, we need a sign that, of approval. You know, we need approval to do this. And Trump said, oh, consider yourself approved. This is a wonderful thing. Like he said those things. So nobody think that, you know, uh, like, I don't care if you voted for Trump. Like, it's time to stand up about this I one because it's going to be your property they take. <laughs> and, yeah, we had actually put some... St- like into that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just... No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, Eric Holder had actually tightened control of um, the department's asset forfeitures back when he was what uh, head of DOJ, mm-hmm. and and there was actually some change slowly starting to occur, just kind of like the consent decrees, right, which are now all just not all of them because some cities are still upholding them or at least saying they are, but uh, Sessions has taken them all off the table. Um, and just as he's doing the same thing with, you know how, it's the, we're, so you're used to this, anything that was passed during the Obama era is being completely reversed, even if it was a small step in the right direction. And that's all it was because all this shit was still happening. It was just a small step. Yeah. I mean, that, that's well, you the, know. you look at Democrat, Republican, like, yeah, most of the time, I mean, they're both awful. They both should have never been invented to parties. They should leave the earth right now. But most of the time, yeah, right. Uh, present day Democrats are a little better than Republicans. But this is one of those things, like you just said, oh, wait, here's something in the right direction, as small it is, as it is. And then Republican comes into office. Bam, there goes that, right? Just like the, you know, transgender uh, transgender issue. Yes. Uh, so many things. I mean, set, well, Sessions alone, he, he didn't have anything to do with the transgender thing, but in the military, but Sessions alone is just rolling stuff back. He's trying to roll stuff back to 1870. I just want to say uh, that nobody had anything to do with the transgender ban in the military, but Trump, Mattis even came out and said he's pissed off about it. Wow. Well, I don't know if you guys seen that. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there's one fact that should be brought up and said very loudly about this excuse about the cost of transgender members of the military. I saw numbers that said the total spent by the U.S. military regarding transgender members of the services was something like $7.1 million for the entire year. One trip... Tomorrow, Lago. The actual number million. is eight billion, and um, but that's four trips to Mar-a-Lago. There you go. So somebody, yeah, it's on the somebody, same side issue. <laughs> somebody, I don't know which um, independent media um, ran this, but they were they were showing that compared to like Viagra and, and different drugs like that. Yes, and how much higher those were. There, theirs are eighty six billion dollars a year. Yeah. For Viagra. That's just for Viagra alone. That was that was yeah, that was it. Yep. More on Viagra. And while you're on this, another thing, on Wednesday when the transgender ban came down, two other massive uh issues with the LGBT community occurred within the administration as well that just got overshadowed by the transgender ban, but should actually be discussed. And one of them, um, basically, they just got kicked in the face all around. Uh, the DOJ stepped in. They intervened into a lawsuit, uh, a big lawsuit that we'd been waiting for. Because, see, it's still legal in 27 states to fire someone if you perceive that they are gay or transgender, even if, you, even if there's no proof. If you just perceive it, it is still legal in 27 states. And so the DOJ intervened in a lawsuit on Wednesday and put their foot down and said that the 1964 Civil Rights Act does not cover LGBTQ and that those states are still able to discriminate on that. And then right after that, Trump announced that Sam Brownback, who is the governor of Kansas and one of the most hateful politicians in America, um, is now the ambassador to the 
quote, international religi- religious freedom. Oh, it's not even a program. It's just called international religious freedom, um, you know, which is code for being able to discriminate against anything Christianity doesn't like. So it's not all religious freedom, right? It's just Christianity. Well, it's so yeah, close to the same things Islam doesn't like, so they should, you know, I don't understand. Absolutely. It's crazy. Absolutely. Well, Brownback, you know, he's, he's, he's the Kansas governor. Well, now he's not anymore. He's taken this new post, but he's governor of Kansas. I, myself, live in Kansas. I can tell you I know lots of people in Kansas from both sides of the political spectrum, and I can't even find a Republican or a conservative that likes Brownback. They all think he is a corrupt, treasonous piece of shit. That's how bad he is. I believe it. He's a hateful bastard. I just wanted to put those two out there because that's something that, that a lot of people, of course, w- there's so much information, right, being thrown out of so much everything, whether it's Trump or DOJ or another person being killed by the police. It's hard to keep up with all of the information, much harder than it was a year ago, and it was already hard enough then, especially mm-hmm. as a news junkie and a sociology professor who, you know, this is what I do. I try to have my students see how the shit that I'm teaching them actually directly relates to what's going on today. And thank you, Nolan, for ruining my Karl Marx. I never really looked into that. <laughs> fact. I'm not going to lie. I looked it up as soon as you said it, and you're absolutely right. Nobody ever showed that shit to me uh, in the 15 years I've been here in this uh, career as Karl Marx is the quote-unquote father of sociology, and now now I'm going to go cry after we get off this call. Um <laughs> But <laughs> I'm not mad or I, I'm glad I know because I'm amazed no students have ever thrown that at me before. And I it's do what I can. Will, it will absolutely be discussed in my classroom from here on out, too. I mean, we can still, you know, we still talk about the contributions to sociology, but we're going to bring that shit up as well. So I do thank you. I, I'm still going to cry, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's so much information that, that is coming out is my point that it's hard to keep up with with some of these things. And a lot of it is distraction so that other shit can get passed. Oh, yeah. And and we know that, and that's common. That's very common, um, and and it just amazes me how often we if we if I fall for it, we all fall for it, and some maybe less than others because they know it's distraction. But with a president like Trump who goes out and does a fucking speech less than an hour, we go on air, you know, telling cops to be more brutal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard not to. And that's not even a distraction, that, right? That's, that's, that's just. <laughs> improve what we're doing in our eyes it's good so let's improve what we're doing but then distract them from this again tomorrow we'll figure something else out to, to do you know you know what though i think they're really trying to go for a checkmate though i mean think about it like like everything they're doing right now they're they're starting like a total 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 war on activists and i think this is all part of it like like um the 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 thing we talked about last week with with um not being able to speak against against Israel's treatment of the Palestinians or or speaking up for Palestinians you'll get fined and jailed for that that can easily lead to speaking against the US government and any and any officials i mean so simply and then you have activists could be run down in the street and people can get away with it um, civil forfeitures. How long before do you think it'll be before they say, "Oh, you de- donated money to these people's Go GoFundMe account that that went to a protest that got arrested"? Um, now we're gonna. Take they already you. tried that with Assange. Remember? Yeah, what I'm and saying, so, I'm I'm saying with just the average people in the streets. Oh, you're absolutely right. I know. I just wanted to say it, it, yeah. that's not a lot of people would hear that and go, "That would never happen." And I just want to say that not just Assange; they did it with Snowden as well. That if you got, oh. you know, if they could prove that you had donated to these things, that they were going to be able to arrest you for quote unquote terrorism. Well, also take all your all your uh, everything you own. You exactly. Know, take your property. Take your money. Take, shut down your bank accounts because these people they they ran. I mean, they randomly rounded up and kettled 200 people arrested them and they're trying to give them 80 years mm-hmm. 80 years well you know that that's interesting that y'all put that on the table because until trump got elected uh the white majority of you know this country was okay with this country all right, all right most part yeah cool all right, we love America, God bless America, blah, 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 blah. But when Trump got elected, 
then the whole resist quote unquote started and people oh this what is this we don't like this because it affects them now you talk go back to the 60s when stokely carmichael was kicked out of the country it was he was going to be killed you know and so many other black panthers put into jail just for trying to defend black people uh fred hampton 21 years old murdered for trying to get all groups of oppressed people together peacefully so now you're talking about yeah oh if you speak out against israel you're going to go to prison uh and like you said tim that could be going going full force 100 yards into the end zone for anything you talk bad about the bill of rights oh there's five years you talk bad about the constitution that's 15 years you say anything bad about uh president trump that's 25 years you know and then comes the police Oh, jeez. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, and or you already, even, or even, but well, you already get arrested for for if you say or don't say anything when you're around a police officer. No, I'm saying this isn't if you say something around them. This is if you just are critical about Israel online. You can they can bring this against yeah, you yeah, if you yeah. if you support a boycott. They could bring this against you. I oh, mean, yeah. so so what if I say, oh, the U.S. government or Wells Fargo is supporting a pipeline, I'm going to boycott them. Well, that's illegal, yep. too. I mean, that's such a slippery slope. That's Turkey's problem right now. Uh, it's a free, you know, you look at America, and if you actually believe in the constructs of the American dream, a free state is what we're supposed to live in, Right. But that, like you said, slippery slope, that's how any of those perceived things, in full or not, whether they obviously they're not, they've never been in full capacity, you talk about free speech and whatnot, but in some capacity, yeah, we can say what we want, and we can go protest, and, and sometimes you won't get arrested and all that, but slippery slope, you keep adding these things, you keep putting people like Jeff Sessions in power, yeah, you could get to a point where you have martial law. And that's why I, I have said for a couple of weeks now, I think Trump's getting a second term. Because you look oh, at... Oh, yeah. I've been saying yeah. the same thing. Because b- look at, b- look at uh, the primary. Oh, he's not going to win the Republican nomination. There's no way in hell. Whoops, he just won the Republican nomination. There's no way he's beating Hillary Clinton. First lady... Senator of the great state of New York, come on, she ran, she almost beat Obama. Give me a break, and then he becomes president of the United States. Whoops, and he's more popular than Hillary is now, which is amazing to me. I know Hillary is awful, and she didn't even she couldn't even beat Donald for the reason of people just don't like her. But that's that says a lot to me. Yeah, he's because like the Gotti, and she's like the other mob boss you don't know. He's a boisterous criminal, and she's a, a, a criminal that pretends to be something she's not. So yeah. she's just easier at hiding. Like I said today, I don't understand why these people pick one or the other. Oh, lock her up, lock her up. Oh, Trump's a criminal. How come you can't comprehend they're both criminals? I don't understand these people. It has yeah. to be one or the other. Lock them both up. Because then you're not on a team and nobody will support you oh, and you don't the, belong. No, Glenn, Bernie you're wrong. Sam. You're wrong. They're on the winning team. That's the people. <laughs> and you as can't I tell, run a campaign without money. But hey, that's last, not the message, though. The last you two know, shows, I've, I've, I've given out this inspiring information. We outnumber the military and the police in the United States. 10,000 to 36, I believe. But we are apathetic. Well, we need to well, get off that. And I know it's not going to yeah. happen. I'm sorry. I, I, well, I'm telling you from a professional sociological standpoint, it's going to take a whole hell of a lot more before these compliant, apathetic Americans get off their ass. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll say that I agree with you both. And I'll explain my reasoning. Uh, the majority of this country... It's going to remain apathetic. That I agree with that one hundred percent. That being said, 
if a revolution is going to happen, and I base my entire life's work on this, the people who are oppressed need to stand up and come together and shove the truth down the majority's throat. Yes. And I don't mean like violently or anything. I'm just saying enough of us come together where they can't look away anymore, where it's on the front page every day. And it's not just one time, one month ago, CNN does a, a little story on Sunday night on Native problems in America and then forget and never do another one again, you know, every day. And, and they have to make a decision. White America has to make a decision. Um, do we want this racism and bigotry to keep going? Or do we want to stop it and ask, okay, no more America. And just make them make that decision. Uh, but it's, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, speaking from my, from my standpoint, my point of view, and my people, uh, we've been waiting for a train at the bus station since we got here. We've been waiting for someone to help us. We've been waiting for the majority to say, oh, this is awful. These people are not subhuman. They're just they're people just like us. Let's stop hurting them. We've been waiting this whole time. Let's vote it out. Let's vote it out. Somebody will finally come to the forefront. Bernie Sanders, LBJ, Hillary, somebody's going to save us. No, no one is going to come save us. We need to do this ourselves. And we need to do this as a collective uh, because, yeah, it's hey, Nolan, the majority is not going to do it. You're from you're yeah. from around here, too. Uh, Los Angeles. I don't, yeah, I know. I don't know how, how many, how it is in other places, but I assume it's the same. If you go back maybe 10 years and think about the homeless people here, there was a mm -hmm. lot of homeless people, but nowhere near as many as there is now. They're spread out everywhere. They're in colonies. They have, like, tents under freeways oh I yeah mean, i mean they're under bridges they're they're living next to in rich neighborhoods poor neighborhoods they're everywhere and this doesn't seem like it's going to be a problem that's going to be going away and it seems like it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse over the years the coming years you know in a few years and there's a lot of them that are white so mm -hmm. what do you what do you think's going to happen when the homeless people start to really outnumber the police coming to take their stuff eventually I mean, people are going to rise up. We have nothing. We have nothing to lose. What do you think is going to happen? I, I've been thinking about that for a while after Trump uh, won and the resistance started, quote-unquote resistance. Um, because part of me thought, okay, this is going to give us the kick in the pants to finally stop protesting at random times. Like, when a certain person of color gets killed okay we'll protest around the country for two days and then stop and then forget about it uh and then for white people this is gonna find this may finally get them to realize how screwed up this place is but not really okay so uh but yeah well what if it, we're talking you're talking about getting to a point where poor people of any creed or homeless people of any creed are completely fed up because especially, like you said, under this administration, this could get really, really dark. And it's already getting pretty dark. Under, under any administration, it was getting dark under the last administration. Uh, this, one, this one is going to get worse. But the thing is, you're going to have so many. The people with the so-called so, you know, so good jobs that are better than everybody else and better than the minimum wage earners, when they start losing their jobs due to automation or due to corporate cutbacks or greed, that's when it's going to start to kick off. Yeah. Well, here's, not, here's an example. We're not that far away. Go ahead. Sorry. That's yeah, sorry. Michigan. Uh, there was a, uh, a movie. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Michael Moore came out with this documentary about all the job loss. It's know. called Roger and Me. There it is. Roger <laughs> and Me. Thank you. All the job loss uh, in, in Flint and parts of Michigan. Uh, and that affected a lot of people of, of any race. And uh, that wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. And then we have Flint, very recent. Um, there's more white people, in, I, 
I'm taking an educated guess here. I think there's more white people in Michigan than black people. Um, and still, we still don't have water there. <laughs> Pipes are still messed up, still getting sludge, uh, you know, through our sinks. So I'm not very hopeful that poor white people are going to finally go, okay, 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 this place has to go. Revolution, this is enough. Enough is enough, enough, enough is enough. But, um, I mean, I think it's just going to be one of those things where it just does keep getting worse. I think what we have to do, everybody on this show included, and any legitimate white allies who are listening to the show or not, we have to continue to push forward to get to that point where we have enough people to show the majority, okay, here's the truth, past, president, past, present reality in the United States, bam, make your decision. You want this to keep going? You want this to stop? And my, I'll tell this story till I'm dead. My father, who was in the movement before I was even alive, uh, he said to me when I was a kid, one of the biggest things in the 60s, uh, Michigan is 80% white. Uh, some uh, gal just put that in the uh, our, our chat uh, for the show. Um, my father said one of the biggest turning points for the civil rights movement in the 1960s was television. Because, sadly, this fact is still true to, to this day. White people thought, oh, well, slavery's over. So, you know, we're all equal in America, blah, blah, blah. But then they see TV. They see, the, they see black people getting uh, pounded by hoses, dogs being sicked on them, uh, little black girls getting killed and bombed in a church, et cetera, et cetera. And they go, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. Let's, let's do something. The civil rights bill gets passed, voting rights passed, you know, and we get our last semblances of, you know, rights. That, the 60s was basically it. You know, things have gotten a little better in certain areas, and sadly some areas have gotten a little worse, but that was basically it, you know. But the point is, the truth has to be put on the main stage, where it, you can't look away from it. Uh, you can't just have a documentary here and a documentary there, and they're all, I mean, when they are made, they're great, and I applaud the people doing them. Um, you can't just have an article here, an article there, a show there, a show here. It has to be, and, and for this country to finally fold, it has to be mainstream. It has to be where people can't look away. That has to, that has to be it. Because people are so, of any group, creed, race, whatever. In this country, our minds are so twisted from birth, it's ridiculous. I mean, and if you're talking about white people, nine, as soon as you're nine months, studies have shown nine months, you can be taught racism. Nine months. Robots. Wow. Robots are being taught racism in the United States. Robots. Yeah. So the truth has to be mainstream. Where people cannot look away. Wouldn't, wouldn't racism be, for, for robots, be speciesism or something where they just hate non non mechanical life or non well it, well it'd be right um I, I don't know how you would equate that since it's a robot but they would have prejudice towards certain races of people of humans oh i thought yeah, there's algorithms all humans. To, yeah, there's algorithms so that they can like certain colors better than yeah. others and you know uh look at certain hairstyles and um you know, decide that that's a threat. I mean, it's, it, it would be pretty easy to program robots to be racist. I never thought about it before, but yeah, that's, that's actually an easy thing to do. And now that, now that you brought it up, Nolan, I'm not surprised at all that that's going on. And uh, the, one of the, I just pulled it up because this is where I learned that in the first place, uh, independent, the independent, uh, AI, artificial intelligent uh robots learning racism sexism and other prejudice prejudices from humans study finds quote these technologies may 
perpetuate cultural stereotypes. So that I'll leave, I'll I'll tweet it out and I'll send it in the uh, show's chat. But there you go. That's crazy. Robots. Yeah. Well, I think the issue here. I mean, being outside the United States, what I see, where I see Trump going with his speech to the police today, this is very similar to just before the Nuremberg Laws. Hmm. This is exactly what Duterte is doing in the Philippines. And, you know, if you watch the the high-level corporate news services you see Duterte giving his speech about I'm going to kill criminals they don't deserve to be here blah 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 then if you watch something else like say Al Jazeera or something like that they actually have reporters in the barrios where the cops are just showing up like hit teams they're not even hiding their badges anymore it's playing out in the open. The state is eliminating people simply for the purpose of eliminating them. You know, and if Trump can get enough people to execute his agenda, then everybody's in danger. But this is the thing that's always happened in history. It's especially in Germany in the mid 20th century. You know, you see all the quotes pop up all the time. Well, they came for the communist. I wasn't a communist. They came for the homosexuals. I wasn't a homosexual. They came for the Jews. I wasn't a Jew. And then guess what? There's nobody to stand up for you. And it's the ultimate divide and conquer. It's been around forever. It's not going to go anywhere. But it's the met- the method of delivery that's always changing and always coming at you from a different place at a different time. It's It's overwhelming. And as long as people are conditioned to be dependent on a new input every five seconds instead of thinking about what the last input was, I find it very hard to ever break free from this constructed society that we're presented with. Because it's not the reality. Everybody knows that who has a real life. But, you know, when you keep all these lower middle class and working class white people fighting to pay their own bills every day, that's all they're concerned about. That is their milieu. That's what that's their war. And if you can convince them that this is who's responsible for causing your war, people are going to jump on board. So, you know, it's just going to be a tough fight. And it may end in complete madness like it usually does. <laughs> but I don't know. Hang on. Well, that's the funny thing to me when I hear it, the, the if this gets really bad. Which it is could. Bad. Well, I mean, it, 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 like you said, it could get a lot worse, like like we've been saying. But for my folks and indigenous people, it's been pretty bad for a very, very, very long time. So there's two, there's two sides of that for me. The one side from, from our standpoint is how much more are we going to take until we just can't take it anymore because uh, for some reason i think it's just s- survival instincts both of our people are very patient uh it amazes, it's, i'm amazed that black people aren't leading the league in mass shootings it's white people by far but nevertheless uh, and then the other side of this is when is it going to get to the point where we have a riot every day from from the white majority and just the majority of the country for the most people uh, where people are just fed up 
uh, because health insurance is too tough to get, because I can't get a job, uh, because the internet is no longer free, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's scary, but it's interesting. Yeah. Man. You got me off topic. Get out of control quick. Oh dear, what did I miss? You know, I think I think it's just the people people just won't be used to having to wake up where they live and be in in kind of like a civil war. That's going to be the difference. It's going to suck. Oh, yeah. people are going to have to get used to it quick cuz that's just where it's headed. Because now it's different. It's like nobody's really fighting back. I mean, even even at, at Standing Rock, nobody fought back. Well, there's there's a, there's a I mean, there's tactics to that. There's also uh, spiritual and uh, philosophical practices to that. If you're talking about Standing Rock, but and and, and also just, I'm ta- I'm talking about any time, Nolan. I mean, it's like it comes a time when people are being brutalized. And you clearly outnumber them. Don't let them take anybody that's not doing anything wrong. Don't don't let your people go down. Fight back. If you got to kettle the cops, kettle the cops. I mean, I've seen situations where there's 300 cops, 400 cops controlling thousands and thousands of people that, you know, like if it came down to it, it would be over with. But well, it never happens. That, but, you're, but you're also talking about the modern Roman Empire the most technologically advanced military and most powerful military ever. And it's not even close. And I'm another thing my, my father taught me, my father just happens to be very intelligent. I, I, I brag about him. So I apologize if I'm doing that too much. But another thing he told me, uh, we thought, and he's thinking we as the movement, uh, uh back in the day, we thought that, Hey, you know, and we just get a bunch of guns and a, a bunch of ammunition and just get together and go to the capital and try to take this country by storm, then we can finally be free. And then they, he says, well, then we realized we'd get slaughtered in five minutes. Uh, now, that's just from the construct of black people. Uh, if you're even if you're talking about like I don't know how many people you're t- you know an uprising of the majority of the country, you still we don't have nuclear weapons, we don't have uh, ballistic missiles, we, we don't have drones. Uh, we'd have to I guess we can make our own. You think they're you know, going to nuke their own country? This uh, this you're talking about a country that's bombed cities. Yeah, but they live here. Out of distance. I know. I'm talking about America. I'm talking about Black Wall Street in Tulsa. Uh, so I wouldn't put it past. Philadelphia. Philadelphia, 1985. Um, so I would not put it past America to nuke, you know, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi off the map because too many people got angry. Um which is why the nukes were used in the first place back in 1945 to scare every other country from doing anything to the United States. And how many people have attacked the United States out of one day in September in 2001? Yeah, that would devastate any standing they have within the whole international community. Because especially now, you can get away with things back then you can't get away with now because there's cameras and there's social media and people get information out within seconds. You know what I mean? I don't know. I think uh, I think it, it's it's something that they they're at least considering as an option because yeah, it does it does get rid of like like Black Wall Street, you know? Do that do that to Tulsa, Black Wall Street is gone. And not only that, but you can blame it on some on somebody else and say, see, now we need to protect you from those people. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to up surveillance and we're going to declare martial law. Like, I can see a lot of reasons why they would want to do that. Well, that's nine eleven in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. You know, and this oh. this would be bigger than that. But but you know, I mean, who thought they'd do nine eleven? 
who thought they'd do that shit? But here, here's you the know? thing. Every time something happens and we don't stand up and fight back, they put more stuff on us. So when, are yeah. you gonna, when is everyone going to say, oh, we shouldn't do this. We'll get slaughtered. We'll get slaughtered. Well, you know what? Be, before, eventually, you're all going to be in cages. Eventually, you're all going to, you know, have nothing. So I'm, pe- I'm going to beg to differ with that, Tim, because you, you are right sometimes. You know, um, different situations, different, different factors are at play. And, and I can honestly tell you, like, I have no idea how those Standing Rock activists got up day after day and got sprayed and, and maced. And, you know, I mean, had grenades shot at them and rubber bullets and all this stuff. Right. Like, I don't know how they did that day after day and, and didn't fight back, but I, you know, if they had something that I see happening now wouldn't have been happening. And that is because of standing rock, a lot of my friends in my sphere who weren't activists and didn't think there was a problem with um, corporations getting big and getting lawless and a problem with militarized police and these sort of things, they now get it. They're like, oh, there are, because people can even not fight back. They can just stand there and they will do this to them. So that, that was the upside to them not fighting back. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a time because, because there, there's more going on than just, you know, what's going on right there in that field. You know, there's, there's media, there's public opinion, there's, um, you know, all these different factors. So I, I get what you're saying. You know, had I been there, I probably would have just like lost it and, you know, fought back. I would have been on my own and that would have ended. No, I'm, saying, me, I'm not but, saying when you're but, you know, outnumbered. I'm saying when you have them outnumbered, I've been, I've been to small towns where they bring in all these cops and there's, and all the cops there aren't even in the hundreds and there's 30, 60,000 people there. And I start screaming, rush the courthouse and everyone starts jumping. And all of a sudden you got some people, no, 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 nonviolence. You know what I mean? It's it's crazy. You outnumber them. They're scared. You can see the fear on their eyes. They bring all the black cops and line them in front of the white cops to try to, you know what I mean? Yeah. We, yeah. That, that definitely, we can win right there. That There's no happens, reason. And but then in that af- case, you can definitely win. But then after that, you're talking about a reaction. And especially under a Trump administration, you, where blue lives have never mattered more. I can only imagine the pushback uh, in terms of bringing what the National Guard in, uh, possibly bombing that town out of existence, uh, arresting everybody involved and putting them in, uh, 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 to a black, like, a black site location where they'll never be found again. Do, I you mean, really, do you really think nowadays if they just bombed a town full of American citizens, everything wouldn't go haywire? There'd be protests in every street across the country, I think. Sure, but just like there were protests in every city across the country after Trump got elected and then we all went to sleep. Right. Yeah, but they I weren't protesting that it could anything. Happen. I mean, what was it? Trump. Trump was no different than Obama. Really, he just more. He just just more well, blatant about. Oh no! Look, I dislike uh, President Tom. A fascist. More than a fascist is but, a fascist. It doesn't matter. They're all oh, against us. Sure. They're all leading us toward fascism. One, we're talking about the level of evil out of ten. I don't know. Trump's a nine, and Obama's a five. I mean, but right. I mean, Trump is much. I mean, geez, Hillary's much worse than Obama, and Hillary was his SOS. It's a succession. It goes. Each one's going to be more bad than the last, and that's what's going to happen. Once Trump leaves, they're going to be so happy to get the next smiling idiot in. He's going to be exactly. evil and be able to do whatever he wants, and these people are going to be like, yeah, great, Trump's gone. We got this great guy who's doing more stuff than anybody. Watch. Well, that could happen. You could have... Uh, Trump have Jeff Sessions roll back the FDR rule where he gets a third term. You know, right. a lot of things could happen. Or it could be just or, a you Democrat. know, just completely get rid of voting altogether as yeah. the commission is working on at this moment. I'm just and saying that, it maybe, never gets better. That's all I'm saying. It never maybe, gets better and we never fight it. Maybe to your original point, Tim, um, <laughs> one of your original points, uh, if Trump or somebody else or whatever 
starts treating white people exactly the same. I don't think this will happen, but I'm just playing devil's advocate. If they don't let millions of white people vote, if they start killing white people by the bowlful daily, uh, if thousands and tens of thousands, or I guess in this case for the population disparity, it'd be hundreds of thousands of white women and girls go missing uh, or, or, or end up dead, then maybe that would be a different story. Um, because if you're talking about voting, I mean, there's, there's over 2 million black people in this country who still can't vote. And there's, there's, a, there's a, a law that says that we, should, we can vote. You know, that was passed in the 60s. Um, and the na- natives have the same problem. Yeah, I don't. I don't uh, see any protests now without white people. Generally, I mean, that's what happened at Standing Rock when the white girl's arm got blown off. It got all the coverage. Whenever mm-hmm. something happens, so yeah, you 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 best believe if they blow up a town with a bunch of protesters, thirty, forty thousand people, a lot of those people are going to be white. Yeah. Uh, so then you wonder what would happen after that. I mean, I think. Okay, it's a glass half full. Uh, we're not that dark right now. Things aren't that dark in terms of Trump has not gone gone full Fuhrer mode. You yeah. know, the internet's still free. Uh, martial law has been enacted. The, uh, the U.S. Capitol building hasn't burned down like the Reichstag in '33. You know, none of that's happened. Okay, but you're going to uh, say I've been saying this since Bush and Obama and Clinton that we need to we need uprising, we need to stop this, and it keeps getting further. So what at what point do you say, oh, it's gone far enough where we're going to stand up and actually fight it? That's going to be different for each individual, though. That's yeah. the problem, and with the apathy with the majority of the population being as apathetic as they are, they're more worried about fighting each other. That's why we have these splits. That's why we have Republican versus Democrat. That's why we have male versus female. That's why we have black versus white. You know, it hasn't always been that way. Even if we look at the construction of race, Catholics weren't considered white into the 70s. So you had that Catholic versus Protestant. You had Irish versus Italian. Neither con- considered white until laws put them in place to be white for citizenship. Oh, I can go on and on and on a lecture there, but that's not what it's about. My point is, is it's what divide and conquer does, and it works, and it works yep. well. And look at this country. We are so divided that even if, even if the worst possible thing happened, I don't even know what that would be at this point, but it wouldn't bring us together because just as you said earlier, I do care that you voted for Trump, and I do as well. Believe me, I've cut so many people out of my fucking life, but that's, how is that helping the situation if we're that divided? And I'm right there with you, Tim. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. Believe me. I'm right there with you. I don't want racists in my life. I don't want anything to do with them. But if we keep that division, we have nothing that we can come together on. And then if we keep fighting one another – and I'm going to have to bring Marx into this, even though I've learned he's racist. Um, if, we fight one, if we keep fighting one another, then we don't come together and we don't revolt. We don't work together and we don't overcome. Well, let me ask this question. It's a semi-related question, but you, two people brought it up. So now I'm going to talk about it uh, or ask the question. Okay, Trump, you voted for Trump, whoever that is. You should, I'm not going to even look at you. Uh, but what if you voted for the other Awful person. See, I look I'm at not them on as, the false equivalency. I like look you at guys them are. as being no. I look at I look at people who voted for Hillary as being stupid and deceived, and people that voted for Trump as being blatant racists. That's how I look at it. They're both. I I wouldn't vote for either one, and I didn't. That's fair. And I, I don't think, do the false equivalency. I see them as two very different people. Well, so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm 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 too analytical. I'm I'm too logical uh, to a fault sometimes. So. Because when I look at both of those people, and this is why I, I've said, and I've said this publicly, and I would never vote for either one myself, but I, I said, uh, if a gun was on to my temple and someone said, you have to vote for one of these people, I would have voted for Trump. Because I know what that woman has done to my people all across the planet. Uh, he just hasn't had the chance to do it yet, so I don't know. There's just too many unknowns. I don't know exactly what he's going to do. I have too good of a damn idea of what she would have done. Um, so when I look at people who voted for Hillary, I said, just don't look and don't look at me. When I see people who voted for Trump, well, I said no. Let me let me back up. 
when I see people who supported Hillary and supported Trump, I say, don't look at me. Look, look away. I don't want to talk to you. And at least in my mind, if you voted for one or the other, but don't support them and just want it, just, okay, in my mind, this one is the lesser of two evils. I did the, my own equation in my head. Okay, I can deal with that. But if you actually think one of them is going to do anything good and are good people, and you know, yeah, I can't, I can't deal with you. But I, I could, I can get with your two points there. You too. I, I can, I can, I can get behind that. You know how I feel from last week. The lesser of two evils is still evil. Why would I ever, ever in my life vote for either one of them? Why would I want anybody to? Is it's well, then you have the yeah. problems of of. Uh, western politics i mean that that throws everybody in there uh, bernie sanders don't uh, vote revolt or give uh, us Harris, a bunch of parties uh, give us a chance run. to have people's party and pirate parties um well, so this, you vote well I mean, this goes you just don't vote for anybody ever i don't this goes this goes back to the misdirection of the entire process though I mean, I brought this up to some Americans, and they just basically, they had no response. I said, okay, so, I, I United... Hear anybody. Nolan, I do you hear us? Hmm? Nolan? Let me see. Go on, Glenn. I'm sorry. I just kept hearing him talking. While I was talking, you were talking, and I, I, he kept popping <laughs> in and out. So maybe he doesn't hear us. I'm just going to connect back on since apparently nobody can yeah, hear me. I think, I think he can't hear us. I'm, I'm getting him back. Go ahead, Glenn. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, oh, what's this now? I'm getting some sort of... Hello? Somebody turned on video. I think I think for some of us the call might okay. be uh, scrambling. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I said to some Americans, okay, so there's, you know approximately 360 million people in your country and you know however many are are of voting age they certainly that doesn't mean they're able to vote but i mean we're you know close to 200 million people are of voting age how many people got to vote to make hillary the nominee out of those hundreds of millions of people 5,000? Only the Democrats that are, that are selected for that. Correct? It was a lot more than 5,000. Well, you know what I'm saying, though. On a percentage basis for the U.S. electorate, the people who actually choose mm -hmm. who is the nominee is so small. So, I mean, this is a problem right there. We have the same thing in Canada. The people who are selected to be made 50, in 57.6 million voted in primary okay but how many of them voted for hillary or trump you can cut that number way down again well that's what i'm saying it was a uh, 28.5 percent of voters actually came but that that's but you have to understand that's them choosing not to come out for the primaries okay. but then, pe but then so people bitch and complain about who we're stuck with exactly well well, exactly. The, if you choose not to that, vote, yeah. oh, so who who there in the primary who in the primaries for Democrats or Republicans or Green or whatever would have been worth 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 my time? Anybody? Well, see, this this is what I was bringing up. So, okay, we have. Let's just go back to the primary. Okay, we have nobody. I think we all agree nobody on the Republican side worth anything. All you really have is uh, what you have Bernie, Martin O'Malley, uh, and Hillary. Okay. Bernie is awful, but by comparison, I would say better than those two by no, I'm, far. I'm not voting for the right. lesser of two evils. So who would I who would I choose? That's my that's my my point. Um, well, that, that's the I'm problem. Sure. They're all evil. So I, yeah. So why do we keep picking millionaires and billionaires and career politicians? Why not just have some people? Why because not? Because they're not willing to stand See, up and front. The, that's and they won't be allowed to. They don't have the part. money to exactly. do it. They've got to have money. money would, Even yeah, if they money. had the money, they wouldn't be allowed to get that. They would be Bernie allowed Sanders to. wasn't allowed to get to the get past the primary. Only in the Democratic oh. Party. We don't need two parties. We need like 
10 parties, man. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think was it the Netherlands has like 12 and they all have a chance to, to uh, win the, I think it's the prime ministership over there. And voting uh, needs to be one person, one vote. Yep. No electoral college, which is none of that. I mean, this think- isn't, this is another problem I had with some people discussing the electoral college. I mean, I believe in one person, one vote of equal weight, no matter where you are. And I come up against people who say, well, then you've got California and New York and Texas deciding who runs the entire country. Well, where do the people live? That's not my issue. If there are, you know, I mean, look at a place like Wyoming. The entire state has less population than the city I live in in Canada. But yet they have their one congressman and two senators and they get their three electoral votes well how many electoral votes does 850,000 people buy in LA County Mm -hmm. you know this is a problem and people say well there has to be equal representation these these Mickey Mouse states have to have their say too well there's got to be a limit to that because if nobody lives there why do they get a say over 20 or 30 or 50,000 people in L.A. Uh, County. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Well, yeah, and that's, that's a really good point. You know, um, I, I see both sides myself. I mean, you have, because, yeah, I mean, like Wyoming is one of the 50 states, and there's things going on in Wyoming that may not directly affect people in California, but do affect the nation. And if the people in California get a lopsided vote, you know, they might actually, you know, be doing voting in their interests, but would they necessarily be voting in the interests of the country? If something in Wyoming that's big for some industry that affects our economy, you know, so, so I, I, I mean, I, I agree the electoral college is fucked and I don't like it. And we certainly can't have it the way it is today, but you know, one person, one vote too. I see where that could go wrong. Also. There's a lot of places with where this, this still have a bad economy that have crashed and people have had to move away even with this. So I don't think that's such a valid kind of argument. I mean, look at, look at places in the east and the midwest that are just like like just towns that have nobody no work no nothing going on right now they have the equal uh, vote but that doesn't seem to matter for them well i think what i'm trying to say is what's been constructed and being passed off as democracy is anything but and yeah. i think people have to come to the realization that you know you hear a lot of times people say government is people. It's made up of people. And those are the people you have to get to to get change. Well, yes and no, but they're already within the system. And that system is supposed to serve the overwhelming majority that have nothing to do with it. Well, the only way you change that, I mean, you can take this down to your job, your workplace, or your the regular crowd that hangs out at the Generation Pub or whatever. You know, it's like being in a bar and what channel is the TV on? Well, pretty much the bartender doesn't want to put up with any bullshit or a fight, so it's majority rules. Done. This is the concept that has to return to so-called democratic institutions, but that means people have to get involved. And that's the bottom line. And... I say quite often, people get the government they deserve. And I know that's a harsh statement, but it is the truth. If you don't like shit, then find out who made the decision and how they did it. Work on solving that, because that's exactly how you get W, who's evil and stupid, and look at all the people he killed. Look at the progress we've made. We've elected this eloquent black man who increased the frequency of drone strikes by a factor of 10, who killed far more innocent people than W did, but yet that's not the perception. War on whistleblowers. Yeah, it's not the perception. 
And it was said before that, you know, once power is given to the state or to an office, the opposition says, how can you do that? That's ridiculous. You don't deserve that power. Then if there's a change, if the person who hated all that power gets that office, somehow once they're in that office, yeah, this is okay. This is cool. We can use this. Power is never given back to the people. The hypocrisy there is, is, it just, it blows my mind, the, the hypocrisy and the cognitive dissonance. Like, like Trump saying the election's rigged, the election's rigged, the election's rigged, and then he won the presidency. Oh, the election's not rigged. <laughs> you know, we, we need to come together now and, and we need to, you know, uh, make America great again. You know, it's just like, it's, and, and what just amazes me is, is, his followers don't see the hypocrisy. And you know what? The people who did see the hypocrisy in that, if the next guy does that as a left-leaning guy, they suddenly won't see the hypocrisy in it either. You know, it's exactly. not just a condemnation of Trump. Yeah. It's not just a condemnation of the Trump nation, although the Trump nation seems to embrace this kind of hypocrisy to an excess, you know, but, but both sides do it and they just, they keep doing it and they're going to keep doing it. And, it just frustrates the hell out of me. I hate that. I, I hate that. I can't agree with conservatives about good ideas and conservatism because the moment I do, they, they like just try to steamroll me into all the other things. They, they mm-hmm. like use that little bit of, gr- it's like I gave up some ground and yep. they're using it to just now beat me into submission to their entire viewpoint. And people on the left do it too, you know? Why the fuck can't I just agree with you about a thing and, you know, still be allowed to disagree with you about other things or, or you know, a, a thing we have going on? Like, like uh, and there's people on the left, but I'm, I'm focusing on Trump people here right now because Trump is the president. And these people are are visible and they have all the power right now, you know, um, they, they're, they're the ones who say, well, we, we need to, you know, we need to put aside our differences now and work together. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Um, that's a, that actually is a great idea. So what I'm going to do is, you know, these couple things that I feel strongly about, I'm going to put those aside, um, so that, you know, I can, I can relate to you a little better. Now, what are you going to put aside? And their answer is nothing. No. But yeah. because their idea of working together is not working together. Their idea of working together is everybody give up everything you believe and agree with me. Yep. That's, that's what their idea of working together is. Because you know, they're they, right. Because they're yeah, right and you're wrong. But you I'm know right the, and they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> The longest filibuster in the history of Congress was put up by the Senate. Uh, It lasted three weeks. And what they were trying to block was the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That demonstrates quite a bit right there. So when you talk about well, if you didn't vote, you don't have a, a, a voice or you shouldn't talk or all this stuff. I mean, I don't buy that because you're never going to get, if, you, if you're talking about a congressman, or someone running for president, the Senate, all of them are awful. I mean, it drives me crazy. My folks all the time, black people are like, be a Maxine Waters. Love you, Maxine. Maxine. It's like she supported Hillary Clinton. What, what are you talking about? You know, even her anti-Trumpism is, is, isn't even on the level. She hasn't gone in front of Congress in that room with the microphone and go, let's impeach him. It's all during interviews and stuff. You know, yeah. it's all talk. But so, but I also see the other, I, to a point, I see the other side of, okay, if Bernie and Hillary and Trump and the clown show – uh, I don't want anybody from Trump on the clown show on the GOP side. Bernie's awful, Hillary's awful, but Bernie's much better than anybody else. So I'll vote for Bernie if he wins the election, if he wins the primary. Um, but the, you know, I don't. But I don't blame anybody who didn't vote for any of them. Like Tim, I don't blame you because they're all awful. Why would? You, why do you have to vote 
for somebody awful. You know, I, I've what, said what, it. I've said it many times. If we had a pirate party or a candidate that had that I believe had the people's best interest in mind, starting with the poor people, not the rich people, I'd go out and vote for them. But until then, it's I, I don't vote. I revolt. And you're not going to until some kind of actual revolution happens. You're not going to get that person. That person doesn't exist in this construct under this construct because look at take Bernie Sanders for example. Uh, well, why do you think I'm is, so argumentative about starting a revolution? <laughs> exactly, I'm with you. I mean, we were gonna, we're working on the same thing. You know, it's just trying to get other people uh, to join. Uh, but take Bernie Sanders right there. Uh, he is far more progressive, quote unquote, than anybody who's run for president since I can't really remember. Um, FDR. Maybe, yeah, and, and, and this is and FDR is the man who put native and Japanese people in internment camps. But yes, yep. I, okay, FDR. I, I think that that's a good answer. And he wasn't allowed to win the primary. He wasn't yep. allowed to get past the primary. JFK is the most, quote unquote, progressive president this nation's ever had. He wasn't allowed to finish his first term. And this is a man who wouldn't let Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, to his inauguration, even though he said they were friends. Yep. Do you see what you guys so, are doing? This is how everybody does it. They they only, like with Obama, I'm <clears throat> sorry, JFK, all of them. It's like, yes, they did some good things, but they also did a lot of horrible things. And you can't oh, let the evil these, good, these little good things like, overshadow the deaths. I mean, how many how many people did uh, was Obama responsible for killing under his administration? Yeah. I mean, you have, no one, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, he brought in Obamacare and he did this and that. Who cares? With that in itself, what, what is, can we get free health care for everybody? Is that so hard? Like, why do, why do we have to have Obamacare? You know, like, but yeah, of that, course, because right. we have to fight wars and we have to feed the corporations yeah. money. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I agree. It's just that, that, that candidate you were talking about does not exist. The one who is for the pe- truly for the people, not bought by anybody under this construct of this society, this system and this government that that person doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, th- that's why revolution is necessary. I believe it could ex- exist if the people would just demand it. Well, I think under this system, it doesn't exist because it's simply not allowed. I mean, yeah. e- even up here, in what's equivalent to state legislatures down there. I mean, I've been in those parties. I've been in campaign planning meetings. I've been involved with candidate vetting. And it starts with these guys on the grassroots level. If you're not going to support all the bullshit that we stand for but never talk about, you're not even going to get a chance to represent us to the people in an election. And I think the United States is the worst country for that sort of thing. Very early in the process, anybody who wants to get involved in politics to represent, to serve in public office, if you're not a member of the fuck the people team, you don't get anywhere. They don't want you. Exactly. I mean, that's a huge problem. That's a systemic problem. The system is set up to feed the system, nothing else. So, I mean, how do we change this? It's revolution may be the only way. I mean, the bigger the problem, the bigger the cure. Yeah, I think I think we got to look at it true. realistically. People's Radio has, in one year, we got 700 followers. So if we do that, if we do the math and go by that that calculation, by next year we should have ten million, and we'll tell them, let's get out in the streets and do this. <laughs> well, that's that's why, as hard and soul crushing and mind numbing as it is, we have to keep pushing forward. Those of us who know what's right, know is uh, honest about what is really happening and about the, the history. We have to keep pushing forward. Uh, 
And as hard as it is, and as many things as we are blocked from, because we are uncompromising, uh, we just have to keep going uh, and celebrate the victories that we do push through and get uh, and keep trying to better our selves through each other, uh, through uh, true, true systems of liberation from the past and also uh, things that, like you're saying, Tim, uh, right now of other countries or people, uh, ideas or practices or systems that we can learn from and use ourselves. Um, and that's that, like the pirate party in New Zealand, uh, you know, like the array of options of political parties, uh, in the, the Netherlands, uh, yeah, the, the, to- the Netherlands got the pirate party. Um, uh, New Zealand has the, the, um, internet party, which is a, a version of a pirate, the pirate party. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, but we don't have anything like that here. And, and, yeah. We really need that on the ballot. Something. I mean, even if it's not called the pirate party, we need something that has our best interests. Because I swear, if somebody really went up there and said, you know what? I'm not going to bow down to these corporations. We're going to take care of the people. We're not going to fund all these wars around the world. I bet you. And we're going to give everybody health care, education. You know, I bet you the people would back that. Why well, wouldn't they? Yeah, the The problem is getting that person in the power and that, that I, that philosophy, uh, in the mainstream, because it is just so, I mean, the entire media is against that. The, uh, entire government is against that. I mean, I, I know we're about to wrap up the show, but I'll just, I'll say this. I remember when, uh, Sarah Lee Circle Bear, uh, was a native woman, uh, had two kids at home. She was arrested, like so many uh, colored people are petty, bo- petty bond violation. Uh, she was uh, in pain and telling a jail officers, oh, I'm, I'm in pain. She collapses and they were trying to move her to a different cell. And the, the cops go, stop faking, stop faking. She says, I'm not faking. And then they just walk away from her and she dies. And the two kids have no mom. And that happened in 2015. I contacted about a hundred reporters here and in Europe, mostly here, obviously, uh, only two of them paid attention. One of them was a white woman who worked for the guardian. Uh, another one was Simon Moya Smith, who was an, as a tremendous journalist, uh, who happens to be native. The woman from the guardian wanted to run the story. Her editor shut her down and Simon took the story all the way. Uh, talked to the family, did all the homework, uh, and then some, and published the story, and it got out there. Uh, but that, right, and, and that was through a native publication. So that right there shows you that everything is against truth, justice, and freedom in this country. I think it demonstrates how empire works as well, because, I mean, you look at the fall of the Roman Empire, there were no protests in the center of Italy. It was in the far reaches where it started. And, I mean, you talk about the Internet Party in New Zealand, the Pirate Party in in the Scandinavian states or in Central Europe. You know, it's it's starting on the fringes. And that's that follows the pattern as far as I'm concerned, because, you know, you can go back to in March of 1945, there were still people turning out to the theaters in Berlin to watch the newsreels about Mm -hmm. the great victories of the Reich over the communists and the enemies. And they could hear bombs landing outside the theater. You know, I mean, the homeland, the the central nation of the empire is the last one where change takes grip. And the United States is the nexus of the empire. Yeah. 
And it's going to, you know, I mean, it ain't going to happen until it's already happening, if that makes any sense. It does. I just want to rush it along so he can be free while I'm still alive, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, well, that's my fear. I do not want to, I mean, I know many activists have said this before, but I don't want to die while we're still not, you know, it, it, well, I'm speaking for my people while we're still not free and, and while this nation is still evil as hell and people are just living with their it's like the it's like people are living with their heads cut off like they're chickens running around you know but no, we I gotta think, we can I think you could probably find that same statement in hieroglyphs from <laughs> 6,000 years ago of workers of the pyramids you know mm, I mean yeah. it, it just doesn't go away and I mean I put the quote in the speaker chat, and it's something that I try and keep in mind every day, and it's from Chris Hedges. I don't fight fascists because I think I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. And I think that's something that every revolutionary, every human freedom proponent should remember because yeah the bottom line is hey we're not going to win some of these fights but it has to be done yep amen that's what my my right directly under you i said damn right glenn <laughs> you bet <laughs> so yeah this is um, this is something that people don't want to deal with this is part of the cognitive dissonance that steve spoke about earlier and this is this is the way the shit goes on ad infinitum keep making little problems keep distracting people don't we don't want them to think about the revocation of civil rights for a huge segment of our society because they have to worry about putting food on the table they have to worry about getting their kids to school they have to worry about all these little things in their everyday lives that is a result of how fucked the overall system is. But just keep them busy and distracted and Separated. treading water. Yeah, and treading water in their own problems that nobody has any time to get together and discuss the commonalities and what can be done. I think that's a perfect way to end today's show. I think just, so too. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for listening, everyone who was listening. Um, we'll see you next week. Never stop fighting, y'all. Good to be on the show, y'all. My pleasure.